all living things are made of carbon, and it's all around us. It's in the air, the oceans, and mostly in rocks. But when most people hear the carbon cycle, they think of the short-term cycle where plants and phytoplankton take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, the animals then eat the plants and return carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Less attention gets directed to how carbon gets cycled over much longer timescales. The short-term cycle only happens on a scale of 10 days to thousands of years. Maybe. But the Earth is more than 4 billion years old, so this short-term process doesn't really relate how carbon circulates throughout the Earth over millions of years. Plants breathing in carbon dioxide and you breathing it out is definitely a component of the long-term cycle, but rocks play the biggest role. Rocks happen to contain so much carbon. So much that if we burned all terrestrial life, the released carbon would only result in 25% increase in atmospheric CO2 from the present level. But if we look back to the paleo record, changes in the long-term carbon cycle have changed the atmospheric carbon levels to 10 times the present level, which notably heated up the planet. So how does carbon go from rock to rock? It starts when atmospheric carbon combines with water to form carbonic acid. This then falls down as rain. This comes in contact with silicate rocks like basalt, which then get weathered by the rain, or by plants. Plants secrete organic acids to gain nutrients from rocks. The nutrients that don't get picked up are drained and transported via rivers to the sea. And by these nutrients, I mean calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate ions. Silicate weathering can also increase when mountains get uplifted. The fact that these rocks are on a slope makes them more vulnerable. Once the nutrients finally reach the sea, the calcium or magnesium ions combine with bicarbonate ions to form calcium carbonate, which organisms use as shells. But when the organisms die, their shell gets deposited onto the seafloor, and the carbon is then buried and locked away as a carbonate rock. 80% of carbon-containing rocks are carbonate rocks. The other 20% contain organic carbon that has been layered with mud and then heated and pressurized to form sedimentary rocks like shell. But this is a cycle, right? So how does this carbon get shot back into the atmosphere? When an oceanic plate gets subducted, it returns the carbon within the carbonate rocks to the mantle. And this eventually gets returned to the atmosphere through volcanoes. Or the limestone gets uplifted, weathered, and then transported to the sea. Today, however, humans are adding another factor in releasing the locked away carbon into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels. Coal and oil are concentrated forms of sedimentary organic matter. Over time, these substances would slowly get released as the rocks are uplifted and weathered, but humans are speedrunning this process by burning and oxidizing coal or old organic carbon when they extract it. This is at a rate of 100 times what would occur naturally. So in essence, we're taking the biggest reservoir of carbon available and then shooting it straight into our atmosphere like a bunch of volcanoes. Since carbon plays such a huge role in altering today's climate, we can look at how much carbon was in the atmosphere in the past to see what the climate was like at the time. Let's look at the role of plants in this long-term carbon loop. If plants grow faster, they uptake nutrients faster and thus weather rocks faster, speeding up the process of storing carbon below. Some organisms are more efficient at accelerating this weathering process. Trees, for example, break up and release cations and drainage by a factor of four compared to lichens. And in general, plants grow faster at higher atmospheric carbon levels, mostly because if there's more carbon in the atmosphere, there's more stuff that they can convert into food. In a study with pine trees, the trees in an atmosphere with more carbon dioxide released more bicarbonate ions into the drainage than the trees taking in air that is lower in carbon dioxide. The rise of certain plants has also changed atmospheric carbon levels on a long-term scale, but that's not because they breathe in more CO2. High levels of carbon dioxide were characteristic of the early Paleozoic, but you can see a huge drop in the Permian-Carboniferous period. This is due to the rise of vascular plants, which accelerated weathering of silicate minerals. These plants at the time could only be decomposed by fungi, but because fungi didn't evolve until later in the Paleozoic, the dead plant material simply got carried away and deposited into coal swamps or marine environments. This time period was also characterized by having a low sea level, which meant that there was a lot of low-lying land that would otherwise have been covered by a shallow sea. The vast number of coal reserves are from this area because there was just so much burial during the Carboniferous and Permian. 
At the end of the Permian, carbon dioxide levels rose again during early Triassic. Carbon dioxide levels remained high in the Mesozoic and began a gradual decline into the Cenozoic. This drop was due to an increased mountain uplift in the Cenozoic and also an increase in solar radiation throughout the Phanerozoic. An increase in solar radiation plays a major role on weathering rate because it leads to more plant growth and more rainfall. Solar physicists have found that the level of radiation reaching Earth has increased over geologic time. Four billion years ago, the sun's radiation was 30% less than what it is today, and in the Phanerozoic, solar rays were 6% less than what they are today. Atmospheric carbon has cycled through high and low concentrations throughout the Earth's history, and these varying concentrations can produce drastically different climates.